evening. Welcome to the evening worship services of the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, uh, March the 28th. We will be singing from Songs of Faith and Praise. Uh, we will sing uh, three songs. We will observe the Lord's Supper, uh, sing a fourth song. Uh, I will deliver a message and we will close. And so, if you would please uh, turn your books to number 144. 144. <clears throat> oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing. His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded in praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, it breathes in the earth, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. It was wonderful. If you would please turn to number 162. 162. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. 1, 2, and 4. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him love all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saved you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saved you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. All that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and praise him, Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and praise him. Lord of all. 705. 705. Okay. <clears throat> 
a common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord, a common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's Word. This is the portion of our service where we turn to the Lord's Supper. We know that uh, they observe the Lord's Supper from the very time of the first uh, time that Jesus celebrated it at Passover uh, with his disciples. And then it was observed throughout the New Testament. We know in Acts, the 20th chapter and the 7th verse, it says that they gathered together to break bread. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul reiterates much of uh, what Jesus talked about in the uh, body and the blood of uh, himself uh, to uh, those people at Corinth. And he put it so eloquently, and he talked about the significance of the bread and the significance of the fruit of the vine and uh, the, the, beautiful, the beautiful symbolism there that this would serve as a new covenant in our relationship with our Lord. So as we think about this, let's just remember that uh, all this is done so that we will remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we will remember the wonderful sacrifice that he made for each one of us. And as we take this together, let's make sure that we make this a vertical thing, that we, we focus on the Lord and we make it a one-on-one -on -one thing as, as we partake of uh, the bread and the fruit of the vine. Let's pray for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that uh, uh, you sent your Son to us. We're grateful for all there was about that, his life and his teachings that we have to guide our lives. But as we think in this remembrance at this time when we celebrate what we like to call the Lord's Supper, that we remember that he gave up his body. He gave up his body that we might live. He gave up his body that uh, we wouldn't have to. He gave up his body so that um, a new covenant could be formed between you and I you and us. Bless us as we partake of this bread. It's in his most holy name that we pray. Amen. And in a like manner, he took the cup. And the cup is the fruit of the vine. And the symbolism there uh, in its color, uh, is certainly uh, is the lifeblood of Jesus. In order for Jesus to sacrifice himself, uh, he, had to, he had to bleed. He bled from his head, he bled from his hands, he bled from his feet, he bled from the spot in his side where he was, uh, he was stabbed. And uh, we just uh, know that this blood that was shed on that day was life-giving blood. And the symbolism is so fantastic that blood is what actually gives life to things and gives life to us. And so much more with Jesus Christ, the shedding of his blood gives life to us, forgiving us of our sins so that we can one day reside with you in heaven. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was willing to shed his innocent blood. Help us, dear God, to just always remember what a sacrifice that was. It was a sacrifice on your part, and it was a sacrifice on his part. 
as the human part of Jesus suffered and bled and died. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, let's hearken back 2,000 years ago to when Jesus shed his blood for us. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, we also gather together on the first day of the week and we lay by in store uh, so that there will not be a need later on. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, this is brought forth to us very, very boldly. And it, it talks about churches helping churches. It tells us about churches even that didn't have a lot, gave where uh, it hurt. Uh, uh, it's that uh, two mites that the, the, the widow gave, being all that she had. And uh, as we think of that, uh, help us to understand that what we give indeed is not ours. It's just on temporary loan. When we die, none of that will go with us. It is, it is just a, a temporal thing, but, but in that uh, we use those monies to further your work. Uh, let's pray for the offering. We thank you, to Heavenly Father, that we have the privilege to give back to you. We, we give because of gratitude. We give because uh, we love the one that we give to. We give because we love our church and the mission of the church. And so help us at this time uh, and help us to purpose in our heart each week uh, so that we will be generous, showing the gratitude for all that you've done for us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And the last song before the lesson is number 770. Let's sing verse 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclaw us in our rightful mind in purer lives thy service find in deep reverence praise all Sabbath rest by Galami calm of hills above where Jesus knelt to share with thee the silence of eternity interpreted by love drop thy still dews of quietness till all our striving cease take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. I trust that the Lord was praised in our singing and that uh, he was uh, satisfied that uh, we celebrated the Lord's Supper together. Last week, uh, I uh, 
I delivered a message to you about uh, Jesus sitting on his throne or Christ's reign. I thought there was enough merit to it and there was enough meat on that bone that uh, there's more meat on the bone. And so uh, I decided to put together a, a kind of a, a second lesson very closely related to it. And it is called Christ's Reign. Now, uh, all Christians, I believe, uh, realize that we're abundantly blessed. We're, we're abundantly blessed because number one, Christ reigns as our king, and he also reigns as our high priest. And because he is God, he knows things and has all power. This is the wonderful thing about being a person of God. We have his son, who is our king and our high priest, and we have a God who knows all. And what this does for Jesus is that it makes him the perfect king. You know, we have rulers that rule over us from local officials in the uh, townships or towns or cities where we live uh, to the state uh, officials and all the way up to uh, our uh, elected officials in the House of Representatives in the Senate. We even have a man who we elect every four years as president of the United States. And, and we try to elect good men to these positions, uh, whether they are local or all the way up at the top, because uh, they um, have a part in our lives. But what they lack is what Jesus lacks. Jesus is the perfect king. And with that being said, as the perfect king, he has the perfect law by which we have to live. Now, you know what? We're not always satisfied with some of the laws that we have in our land, uh, some of the local laws or some of the state laws or some of the federal laws. But we, we live with that. And you know what? When... Uh, when the laws just become archaic, as we have different laws than people had 150, 200 years ago, because it was a different time, then new laws are enacted. But the perfect law that Jesus has, has never had to be reenacted. It's never had to be amended. Uh, it's, it's never had to be tweaked. It is the perfect law. And here's how Peter described this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, the, the power that was granted uh, from him to us. We are blessed by this perfect king. And we find it, obviously, in God's word. Not to be tweaked, not to be amended. This is God's word. And the writers we believe to be Holy Spirit-inspired writers. To Timothy, the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, wrote these very, very famous words about the scriptures. It says that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Wow. If we want to be adequate, and I, I believe maybe adequate is the midline, if we want to even be more than adequate, 
we have something that will equip us for every good work. We have the perfect Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God. Now, Jesus, we know, and we've been talking about this in our morning studies about the gospel of the kingdom, has a spiritual kingdom here on earth. And everyone can become a citizen of that spiritual kingdom. Paul explained it in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, where he wrote, For he, that's God the Father, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Well, there's a whole raft of stuff in those two verses. It is the spiritual kingdom of God. And in that kingdom, we were rescued from darkness and placed into the light. We were placed into the light that is the teaching of the Holy Spirit-inspired writers and the teachings of Jesus Christ. Paul also wrote to the Philippian brethren in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. He said, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we all so eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He told the Philippians to await the return of Jesus Christ, even though we were in a spiritual kingdom. Now, that won't uh, his coming back won't change that spiritual kingdom. We are in his spiritual kingdom here on earth. Now, let's throw some more things out that I hope will make this lesson interesting to all of us. First, Jesus could not have reigned as king if he was on earth. If he was on earth from when he was born until now, he could not have reigned as king. And we have scriptural reference for this. Uh, when uh, Jeconiah was the ruling king of Judah was when the um, uh, people of Judah were taken into the Babylonian captivity. And Jeremiah the prophet prophesied and he said these words, A man who will not prosper in his days, for no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. Wow. Jeconiah had ruled in Judea, but neither he nor any of his descendants would ever rule in Judah again. And we learn from Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, the very first chapter of Matthew, it opens up with a genealogy of Jesus. We learn from Matthew that his genealogy came uh, uh, and, and that uh, Jeconiah was in his genealogy. He was in his family tree. That's Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. Therefore, you ready? If Jesus reigned in Judah or Jerusalem, he would not prosper. For this reason, Christ's reign is a spiritual reign from the right hand of God in heaven. And that's what we mean by it being a spiritual reign. Is Jesus our king? Yes. Does he sit on the throne? Yes. Is it a physical throne? No. He's sitting at the right hand of God. But his reign is, is just as real as the reign of the president of the United States is even though he's not physically with us. His reign 
is just as real if he was sitting on David's physical throne rather than the spiritual throne. And just because he's reigning on David's uh, spiritual throne at the right hand of God does not make his reign any less effective. It's just as effective, even more so. So first, Jesus could not reign as king if he was on earth. The scriptures tell us that that wasn't going to happen. Two, since we said that Jesus serves as our king and our high priest, if Jesus would have stayed on the earth, he couldn't have been our high priest on the earth. Now let's trace this all the way back. Before Abraham was Abraham, his name was Abram. And when Abram was warring with the, and battling with the kings around him, he came to an area that actually was to be Jerusalem. And we get this name, this name Melchizedek. Melchizedek, who was the king and priest of God Most High came out to bless Abram. We find that in Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 to 20. Now, this is the first time that the word priest appears in the Bible, right? And this is pre-Moses, right? And so this is, this is way before this. This is before the tribes out of which a priest would come. So this happened before that. This was a priest before the earthly priests. And it was Melchizedek. And from this passage, we don't know anything else about Melchizedek. But you know what? He must have been special. He must have been special because God recorded these events and the fact that he is called a priest of God most high. We find this a thousand years later when David is reigning that David says, the Lord, that's God, the God of heaven, has sworn and will never change his mind. And he said, you, which means Christ, are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus wasn't a priest according to the priests that there would be later on. Jesus was a priest after the order of Melchizedek, preceding what we know of as the priesthood. Now that was in Psalm 110 and verse 14. Thus, we have God affirming for us that Christ is the king. We have him speaking as he is the king. And God is talking about Christ being a king because he has a scepter. We talked about that last week and a rod, just as a king or queen has that rod to designate or symbolize their rule. The, the psalmist in Psalm 110 verse 2 says, The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of of your enemies. Now let's fast forward to Jesus. Jesus was a Jew. Right? He was under Mosaic law or Jewish law. In that Jewish law, priests had to come from the tribe of Levi. No priests could come forward that weren't from that tribe. 
all right, from that specific tribe. Yet Jesus, according to the first chapter of Matthew, when we look at his genealogy, was from the tribe of Judah. And so the Hebrew writer, in his wisdom, talking to Jewish Christians, said, For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing of concerning priests. That's Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. So how could Jesus be a priest on earth? He wasn't, and Jesus was a Jew, he wasn't of the tribe of of Levi, who's from the wrong tribe, to be a Jewish priest. And uh, in, in chapters 5 through 7, the writer of the book of Hebrews makes several uh, arguments uh, about Jesus being not from the tribe of Judah, but being after the order of Melchizedek. And that's why it's a superior priesthood to those who came from the tribe of Judah. His went all the way back to that first priest, Melchizedek. And so, as we uh, finish up here, um, what is our blessing in all of this? How are we blessed in all of this? Now, under the law of Moses, no person could serve both as king and as priests because the kings had to come from the tribe of Judah and the priests had to come from the tribe of Levi. So no king under the law of Moses, no, I'm taking it back, no person could become a king and be a high priest at the same time. However, under the Christian system, under the new system, Jesus is both our king and our high priest. He serves both. He serves as both. And this was foretold by the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. If you get nothing else this evening, here is this rich nugget for each one of us. Being king, Jesus has the power to bless us. Being the high priest, Jesus has the compassion to forgive our sins. Look at the wonderful blessing. We have a king and a high priest in Jesus Christ sitting at the spiritual throne of David, sitting at the right hand of God, who as the king has the power to bless us and as the high priest has the power to forgive our sins. And so let's finally look at how the Hebrew writer sums this up in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, making propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. There, he, there it is. Jesus has the ability as the king to bless us, and he has the ability as high priest to forgive our sins because of that compassion. Now remember, the church is Jesus', is, it's God's spiritual kingdom here on earth. 
And so as we end the lesson, we ask ourselves, and I ask you, are you a member of this kingdom? Are you a member of the Lord's church? Have you gotten to the point where you can receive the blessings of Jesus as king and receive the forgiveness of sins as Jesus the high priest? If you haven't become a child of God by putting on Jesus in baptism, of confessing that Jesus is the Son of God and repenting of your former ways, then you won't be able to do that. You won't be able to call Jesus King. You won't be able to call him High Priest. And so if you need the waters of baptism, all you need to do is contact any one of us and we will come to your aid immediately and see that you are, are taken under the waters of baptism. If you had the need to confess your sins, uh, please do so. Confess your sins to one, one to another as the scriptures tell us that we're supposed to do so that uh, we can be a, a, a viable and powerful part of the church, one of those links that makes the church great. I pray that you would uh, continue to uh, be with us, that you would uh, just uh, continue to grow in the Lord if you're already a Christian and that uh, your, your faith would become more and more powerful. Let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're, we're so grateful for the uh, time that we have designated this evening to uh, gather together, howbeit virtually on YouTube, to uh, uh, sing praises to your name, to observe your supper, and to uh, delve into your word, to find truths that will help us to live our lives better. I pray that you would continue to be with us Continue to bless us. Uh, continue, dear Heavenly Father, through your Son, to forgive us of our sins. Uh, I uh, just uh, uh, offer you, dear Heavenly Father, the people in our bulletin uh, who have asked for prayers, if you would bless them, dear Heavenly Father, in their needs. We ask all this, dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. I pray that you will be safe and that God will bless you all.